Now we'll start part B, which is the soil profile features. We'll be looking at the soil profile in the pit. For our first question, we're gonna be identifying the major soil horizons. When we look at the soil profile, we can see these different layers or horizons, and they differ in color, texture, and other properties. And the reason why they look different is because there's different processes happening in these horizons. We're gonna feel the soils, and we're gonna also look at the colors. So I can see at the top here, I have this brown, dark brown colored soil. It's got a lot of sand in it. And I'll just keep kind of going down and see where I see changes. Down here, I notice that it starts to feel a little sandier and it's lighter in color. So I've put this tee in, the golf tee, right in at 11 inches because that's about where I see this change from the, the brown to this slightly lighter, uh, sandier horizon. I'm just kind of picking with my knife and kind of feeling the soil, how it changes, and then looking for changes in color as well. And I notice as I start getting here, it's a little bit firmer when I poke in the knife and maybe not quite as sandy. And I'm also starting to see the color change a little bit. And as I keep going, the soil gets firmer and redder. So we've kind of got a bit of a transition here. So we're gonna put our horizon boundary sort of in the middle of that at about 19 inches. As I keep going down, there's more and more clay, it gets firmer, a little bit stickier, and it gets a lot redder. And I go all the way down the rest of the profile just looking for any changes. And we can see it keeps getting redder. These are the three horizons that we've broken out. It's from the surface, then our middle one, and then from the lower, the subsoil down below 19 inches. We use letters to designate our different horizons. Some soils have lots of horizons and some just have a couple. We don't see the same horizons in every profile. An O horizon is an organic horizon. It's formed from an accumulation of organic matter. Now this is different than leaf litter that you see uh, in a forest. This is gonna be organic matter that started to decompose. So you can't recognize the different organic particles. We don't have an organic horizon here. Right at the surface, we've got mineral soil. This dark horizon here at the top is an A horizon. Now an A horizon is a mineral soil that has an accumulation of organic matter. So it's mostly mineral particles, sand, silt, and clay, but it's uh, been darkened as organic matter is added to it. So basically our topsoil. E horizon is a horizon of eluviation, which means it's been leached of iron oxides. And that's why it's lighter in color and can be a bit coarser in texture. Iron oxides leach out of this horizon and usually move down into our B horizon, a zone of accumulation of iron oxides. So that's why this horizon looks redder and it has more clay in it. Sometimes you'll see what we call a C horizon. And that's a horizon that's made of unconsolidated parent materials. So they may not have as much clay. They may have more gravel or rock in them. Um, they don't see the accumulation of clays that we see in the overlying B horizon. Our horizon is for bedrock. Since we're on the coastal plain, we don't see bedrock here. But when you're in other parts of Maryland, you might see hard rock that the soil is formed in. And that's your R horizon. When you're answering question one, you're going to check off that you have an A an E and a B horizon. Question two, we're looking at how thick our topsoil is. The topsoil includes the O and the A horizons, if they're both present. In this soil, we just have an A horizon, so we're gonna measure how thick it is. So you'll use the tape measure that's in along the soil profile to measure how thick you see that A horizon. And remember, the A horizon is the uh, horizon that's accumulated organic matter, so it's dark in color. And right about here at 11 inches, that's where I start losing that dark color from the organic matter. So for question two, I'll put 11 inches. Question number three, we're looking at what the topsoil structure is. Structure refers to how the soil particles hold together or aggregate. Um, there's a lot of different processes that can cause structure to form. It could be because of organic matter, uh, the clays or iron oxides that are in the soil, and then other um, you know, physical things like if there's been compaction. We've got three choices for topsoil structure. The first one is granular, kind of looks like cottage cheese. The soil particles kind of form crumb-like structures, usually due to the organic matter and a lot of biological activity in the soil. Oftentimes, topsoil that has really good granular structure is also really dark in color because of all the organic matter that's there. Our second option that we see on the scorecard is blocky, and that's where the aggregates kind of form 
little blocks. Uh, they can be rounded or sometimes more angular. Final option is single grain, massive, or platy. Single grain is when the aggregates don't really hold together at all. You've just got uh, single particles. Massive is when the aggregates don't really form any regular shapes, usually just kind of large clods will just kind of break wherever you force them. They don't break naturally in any sort of regular pattern. Platy is when the aggregates are all oriented horizontally, kind of like plates. We care about structure because that sort of helps us understand how roots and water would move through the soil. Imagine if you have this nice granular structure, it's really easy for the roots to move in there. It's really easy for water to soak in and absorb. There's a lot of pore space. Whereas if we have blocky, the roots might be restricted to just around those aggregates. And then if we have platy or massive, it might be hard for the roots to move down through the soil. And it might also be difficult for water to move through the soil. And to look at structure, break out some pieces of the soil and then kind of look it in your hands and see how it breaks apart on its own. And you can see as I break this apart, they all form into little blocks. So this is an example of blocky structure. Question four asks about soil color. You're gonna be looking at the color for the topsoil and for the subsoil and substratum. Our topsoil color choices are brown or dark brown, reddish brown, gray or grayish brown, and black. When we see a black topsoil, it usually has a lot of organic matter and that often occurs in wet areas, particularly in wetlands, because you have a lot of organic matter that gets produced by all the plants, and then because it's wet, the organic matter is really slow to decompose. Gray or grayish brown is something we see when there's not a lot of organic matter or when it's wet and it's been depleted of iron oxides. Reddish brown we might see when we have a red parent material, so the soil is formed from a parent material that's reddish in color and it parts kind of a slightly reddish hue. The other place where we can see reddish topsoil is when there's been a lot of erosion and some of the subsoil is now exposed at the surface. And then the last one is what we have here is brown or dark brown. And the soil has that color from the organic matter. In part B of the question, the subsoil and substratum, the first one is yellowish brown or red with no redox depletions or gray. The second one is yellowish brown or red with redox depletions. And then the last one is dominantly gray with redox concentrations. Sometimes in the soil, when you're looking in the subsoil, you start to see areas that are gray or reddish. And these redox features are indicative of seasonally high water tables. The iron oxides in the soil give the subsoil a reddish color. When those iron oxides are depleted, the soil turns gray. And depletion happens when the soil is anaerobic, so there's no oxygen, and that happens when the soil becomes saturated. So if the soil is saturated, there's no oxygen left, the iron oxides will go from this red solid form to a soluble form that's colorless. And so the color we'll see left is a gray color, the natural color of the soil without the iron oxides on it. If we look in this soil, you can see it's dominantly red, but we see some gray areas that are depletions. And that's where the iron has been reduced and it's moved out of the soil to another area. We can also see some darker red areas and that's where the iron has re-precipitated as iron oxide in a concentration. So we have depletions and concentrations. And we can use those uh, features to help us understand where the water table is in the soil or where a seasonally high water table is in the soil. Here, since the soil is dominantly yellowish brown to red with depletions, we would check the second answer. Question five is about soil drainage. Drainage class refers to where we see that seasonally high water table. In this soil, we don't see any of those really gray depletions until we get to the very bottom, below 40 inches. In that question, you're looking at what depth depletions come in at. In this soil, it's between 40 and 72 inches. In part B of the question, you're determining the drainage class. The drainage class correspond to what depth the redox depletions at. In a well-drained soil, you don't see any depletions above 40 inches. So the high water table stays below 40 inches. In an excessively drained soil, all the redox features are below 40 inches, and the soil also has very rapid permeability, meaning the water moves through it very quickly. But because the soil is so sandy, water moves through it even more quickly. In a moderately well-drained soil, redox features, those gray depletions, occur between 20 and 40 inches, so in the subsoil.
So you can see in this picture here, we see those gray colors coming in between 20 and 40 inches. Reminder, that's where our seasonally high water table is. In a somewhat poorly drained soil, the seasonally high water table is between 10 and 20 inches. And so we'll see those gray depletions starting within 10 to 20 inches from the soil surface. And then a very poorly drained soil is a soil that has high water table at or near the surface for most of the year. And because these very poorly drained soils are so wet, there's a lot of organic matter that accumulates on the surface. Because remember I talked about organic matter being slow to decompose when a soil is saturated. A very poorly drained soil will have a thick, dark surface, a black surface, and then immediately underneath it, it'll have those gray colors. This isn't really sandy soil, so this would be an example of a well-drained soil. In question six, we're looking at the effective soil depth. The first part of the question, it's effective soil depth, so we wanna know how deeply could roots go into the soil. We're not gonna be looking at how deep they're actually going, but just if there's anything that would keep roots from growing below a depth. One of the things that might restrict growth is if we had something like a fragipan, a hard cemented layer that basically restricts water and root movement downward. Bedrock would be a root restricting layer. And another would be a permanent water table or saturation. In this soil, we don't see anything restricting root growth. So we would put that there's no restrictive feature within 60 inches of the soil, so this would be very deep. In part B of the question, you're just looking for the depth of specifically bedrock. We don't see any bedrock in this profile. We know that the soil is very deep. Bedrock is below 60 inches. Question seven, we'll need to look at the rock fragments in the topsoil and making a visual estimate of how many rocks are there. And we'll have samples for you to look at so you can compare. We care about the presence of rock fragments because they can impact root growth and uh, they might affect certain management uh, practices. So your options are less than 15% gravel, between 15 to 35% gravel, and over 35% gravel. In this soil, we don't see any rock fragments, so this would be an example of less than 15% gravel. Question eight is soil texture. We also have percent clay as a tiebreaker. For the contest, we'll have two samples pulled for you outside of the pit that you'll estimate soil texture on. One will be from the topsoil, and one will be from the subsoil. You'll use the ribbon method to determine the texture, and there is another video available that will show you how to estimate soil texture. Question nine is soil permeability. Permeability is how quickly water moves through the soil. Permeability is usually based on texture. So you'll use your textures from the topsoil and the subsoil to determine the permeability for both of those parts of the profile. Notice we've helped you out here. When you're looking at the different permeability classes, they're tied directly to the soil textures. So if you have a coarse textured soil, water is going to move through it really quickly, that soil would have rapid permeability. As you've got more clay in your soil and it gets finer in texture, you can see that the permeability slows down to the point where when you have a fine textured soil, the permeability class is slow. One thing you want to note is there are certain circumstances where you won't just use the texture. If you have a fragipan present, that's going to have a slow permeability. The other exception might be if a soil that's derived from limestone bedrock and if it has good structure, that rate might be a little bit different than what you would just get from the soil texture. And there's more about this in the guidebook. In question 10, it's the soil reaction. So you're going to be measuring pH. There is a video that'll show you how to use this test kit. Question 11, is topsoil color. For this question, you'll be looking at the topsoil and making a more precise determination. We use Uncell Color Book to get a, a more precise determination of soil color. And there is another video available that'll show you how to use the Munsell Color Book for this question. For question 12, we're asking you to evaluate how much compaction might be in the soil. When a soil is compacted, it becomes really dense and it loses a lot of the pore space. That makes it difficult for water to infiltrate into the soil and roots can have trouble growing because they're restricted. A lot of times compacted soils, you'll see them, they can be really firm and you won't see porosity and oftentimes they have a massive structure. 
or really big blocks or it's platy structure. We actually use a wire flag to kind of evaluate how much compaction is. And what you'll do is you'll hold the wire flag about 14 to 15 inches above the bottom and you'll just try to insert it into the soil. So it's almost like you're kind of acting like a root trying to go into the soil. If the wire flag goes in easily, I don't have to push it, I don't have to wiggle it much, that would be a soil that has very little compaction. If it's a little more compacted, I might have to wiggle the flag to insert it and I might only be able to insert it four to six inches. So that would be an example of a soil that has some compaction. And if the soil was really compacted, I might only be able to insert the flag a couple of inches. We'll have a designated spot outside the soil pit where we'll want you to test for compaction. And one thing you want to be sure is to try several times pushing the flag in uh, because you might hit a gravel or something. Here I can uh, push the flag in pretty easily. I've got to wiggle it a little bit in places. So this might be an example of a soil that has some compaction. That completes part B of section one of the Envirothon exam for soils. Now you'll go on to part C, soil and site interpretations. Remember, you'll use your answers from parts A and B to answer the questions in part C.